The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Sawstop has done an excellent job of reminding us just how dangerous our table saws can be. But I've got an idea that'll bring Sawstop style protection to all of your shop tools with no equipment upgrades. Who needs flesh sensing technology when you've got this guy? That's right, the creepy severed finger dude from the Sawstop ads. No matter what tool you use, he's there to point out the ever present danger. At the bandsaw, at the drum sander, at the jointer, and yes, even hand tools are safer because now you fear them. With the saw stop nubby finger guy around, woodworking is safer than ever. Without a doubt, the table saw is my absolute favorite way to make a tenon. I usually use a dado stack and a miter gauge, and the cool thing is the results are usually top notch. You wind up with nice clean cheeks and nice crisp shoulders, and best of all, if you have a lot of tenons to make, this is a very repeatable process and you could batch your tenons out in no time. Now the problem is the table saw has really come under fire in the last few years in terms of its overall safety. So some folks are going without a table saw altogether. It's hard for me to imagine because I use my table saw on every single project, but hey, to each their own. And if that's the way you want to go, you're going to have to find alternate solutions for things you used to do at your table saw. And I think the tenon is one of those fundamental joints that you should have some other plan B in place for, uh, for creating these things. So what I'm going to show you today is how to do just that using your bandsaw. The dimensions of our tenon aren't super critical, but it's going to look something like what I have here in this walnut board. Now, I do encourage you to do a test run before you make these cuts in your actual work pieces. Always test your setup first, and once you confirm that everything is working and you have a good result, then you make the actual cuts in your final piece. But it all starts by tracing out the location of the tenon on the workpiece. I'm going to mark in from each side to establish the cheeks. And then mark in from each end to establish the total width of the tenon. It's also a good idea to extend those lines to the uh, top edge of the board here. And of course, all this area around the perimeter here, this is waste. To establish the shoulder, you could certainly use your pencil, but I'm going to use a marking gauge here. Because that cut is going to be cross grain, that's an area where things can tear out, so it's always nice to slice that grain ahead of time with a marking gauge. To get this job done at the bandsaw, you're going to need a few basic things. Number one, a reliable fence. Number two, a miter gauge. It can just be the one that came with your bandsaw, it doesn't have to be anything fancy at all. Number three, a stop lock and a clamp. And make sure that your stop lock has a little chamfer cut in the bottom corner and that's going to allow dust to escape. Of course, the final piece of this puzzle is calibration. If the bandsaw is not calibrated properly, you should not expect good results with this technique. A tenon that is wedged or slightly off-center is just going to cause you problems. And of course, if that shoulder isn't perfect all the way around, you're never going to get it to seat properly and it's just going to be an eyesore that's going to drive you crazy. So I highly encourage you to go back into the Wood Whisperer archives and check out the bandsaw setup and tune-up video that we did years ago. It's an old video, but the information is still good. Use that to make sure that everything is perfectly calibrated, you've adjusted for the drift in your fence, and then you want to make sure that the blade is 90 degrees to the table. Once you do that, you should be ready for the next step. So let's set up for making our tenon. My first round of cuts will be my cheek cuts. So what I need to do is set up my stop lock so that I have a controlled depth and I can make all of my cuts one after the other and not really worry about going beyond my line. So the key is to use the stop lock and a clamp here, but first you want to make sure that the workpiece is as far forward as it's going to have to go here. Now this is something I just do visually. I bring my workpiece forward until my pencil line or my scribe line is in alignment with the outside edge 
of the bandsaw teeth. And from that point, I can bring my stop block in up against the workpiece and clamp the stop block in place. Once the clamp is in place, I double check my setting and if I need to make a slight adjustment, I just grab a little block and tap the edge. You might have to loosen the clamp a little bit to do this, but I find that much more accurate than trying to completely reset the block from scratch. Now I'm going to bring my fence in and line up the blade for the cheek cuts. What I'm going for here is to have the blade just on the outside of my pencil line. All right, and that should give me just a little bit of extra material to fine tune that tenon later with some hand tools if I need to. So I'm gonna do one cut on one side and then flip the piece and do the second cut on the other side. And the end result should be a nicely centered tenon. Now keeping this work piece up against the fence is absolutely critical. So here's an optional thing that you can do, and I do recommend that you do it, is to use a feather board. You plop a feather board in place here, and that's gonna make sure that the work piece stays nice and tight against the fence. So that's our two primary cheek cuts. Now, you'll probably have a second round of cuts that you'll need to do on the ends here, and that establishes the total width, or depending on how you look at it, the total length of this tenon. Now, I intentionally made mine so that my shoulder is even all the way around, so I don't have to adjust my fence. But if you have a deeper cut to make here, you would just keep your stop block where it is, but make a slight adjustment to the fence position to compensate for the amount of space you need there. All right, so I'm just leaving mine right where it is, putting my workpiece flat, and making the cut like this. Now the final series of cuts will be the shoulder cuts. So we're gonna need our miter gauge here and we need to push our fence back. Now, if you look at the way this cut would go, if you made this cut and you allowed that little piece to fall off in between the blade and the fence, that can be problematic. Much like at the table saw, whenever you wedge a work piece between the fence and the blade, you can have problems. I will say it's a little less dangerous at the, the bandsaw than it is at the table saw, but it really is still something we want to avoid. So I'm gonna take my stop block and in this case, I'm gonna bring it right up to the front of the blade with a little bit of space between there. And I'm gonna use the stop block here as my reference point, all right? So you're gonna to need to put the fence back a little bit further to compensate for the thickness of your stop block. All right, so once I actually make this cut, this piece is gonna fall off and it will safely just kind of wobble in this open gap between the blade and the fence instead of being trapped. With my stop block clamped in place, I can now make the fine adjustment to the fence and use my pencil mark to gauge the location of the cut. So what I'm looking to do is get the blade completely in the waist, but I want this very outside edge to rub right up against my marking knife line. And that should give me a perfect shoulder with no tear out. Now back at the workbench, we could take a look at our handiwork. And frankly, this came out really good. If I did have the mortise here to try, we might find that this is ready to go as is, and that's really the goal. But you should always look at your shoulders, make sure everything is nice and square, and then fine tune it if necessary. So take a square up to the side like this. And what I notice is we do have a little bit of room for improvement. The cut on the long cut of the shoulder here is a little bit higher than outside at the edges. And that's what a shoulder plane was made to do. So a couple of strokes should take care of that little bit of extra material. So after a couple of strokes, we can just double check, make sure it's nice and square and that's looking pretty good. All right, so you wanna continue around the entire perimeter and make sure everything is you know, pretty much nice and square. The thing is, in all likelihood, if we have this situation on this side, we've got the same exact situation on the other side. So take a couple of strokes over there, and then you just wanna double check it in all dimensions to make sure that your shoulder is in the same plane all the way around. Fortunately, with a good setup, this amount of work is quite minimal. You shouldn't have to do very much.
Now, if you were actually fitting this tenon to a mortise, there are two other adjustments you might need to make if the fit isn't absolutely perfect. Number one is the actual length of the tenon. You may just need to take a chisel and remove a little bit of that material from the outside edges to make sure you have a perfect fit. The second thing is the thickness of the tenon. If you left yourself a little bit of extra material here, you could just take a rabbiting block plane or your shoulder plane and take a few strokes off of each side and just make sure you take an even amount of strokes off of both sides to keep this tenon nice and centered. If you dial in your setup though, you should be able to get this pretty darn close right off of the tool. Now I'm not going to sell my table saw anytime soon, but hopefully you could see that the bandsaw is certainly capable of producing a clean and accurate tenon. And heck, it's even repeatable because you're using a stop lock, so you could certainly batch out a number of these in short order. Now, honestly, I think it's really important for us as woodworkers to learn multiple ways to do any particular woodworking task. And this way we're not tethered to one particular tool. If that tool should break or maybe a blade is out for sharpening, you don't want to say, well, I can't cut a tenon until I get that blade back, right? You want to have other ways to do it. There's certainly lots of ways to go about skinning this cat. Now, if you have some suggestions for how you might otherwise make a tenon not using the table saw, just leave me a comment in the comments section at the website. Uh, you know, and I'd also like to hear how you might improve the process of cutting these at the bandsaw. Thanks for watching.